So our panelists are uh, Elena Heishmeyer, Elena Daviti, Carlo Hughes, and James Ward. And normally, uh, these four people should be able to share the microphone and video if they want to, because I've made them presenters in the room. I hope that will work. Thank you, Isabel. Um, it's a great honor for us to have this panel here, and it's fantastic. It's really good because what we thought was that uh, rather than going for more, yet more uh, PowerPoint presentations, we could just simply have a conversation with some of the key players in this kind of emerging area of trans-speaking or interlingual re-speaking because for us it's particularly important to to get the views from uh, academia. So we have Elena Daviti from the University of Surrey, who, <laughs> hello Elena, to see you, who um, Hi, is leading the, leading the SMART project. Um, she'll tell us about it, but it's basically a research project on, on interlingual re-speaking, so the second project on, on this issue, on this topic. Then we also have um, Carlo Eugeni, who is himself an interlingual re-speaker, uh, intralingual as well, and he is also a trainer and a researcher. Um, it would be great if he could tell us also a bit more about some of the research that he's done comparing different methods to provide you know, speech to text interpreting. We also have Daniela Eichmeyer. She's been helping us with the project a lot as well, trainer and re speaker herself. And we have James Ward, who is um, who works for AI Media, one of the companies that is currently providing the services. And again, it, it would be great to have his views about um, the options at his disposal, the um, options that are involved in different ways of using technology as well and speech recognition or automatic or uh, machine translation. So this is the kind of conversation um, that we'd like to have as lively as possible, flexible um, and not necessarily with kind of long speeches which you, you, you've all had uh, the whole day. So, so this is it and um, I would like to start maybe with, uh, I don't know, James, if you are around. Yes, hi. Hey Pablo. Hi James, good to see you. Good to see you too. Wonderful. So maybe we can start with this set of things, which would be um, the demand that is that, that you can see, um, what you guys are doing about that demand, how you're currently kind of catering for that. And then we can turn yeah. to uh, the professionals and then to Elena uh, as well. So if you can just tell us a little bit about it. Sure. Um, and thanks uh, for inviting me uh, to this um, discussion. Apologies, I haven't been able to be here all day, but it's it's great to be a part of, of something that I think is um, is a really interesting um, uh, um, space at the moment. I think there's certainly from from AI Media side. So we uh, AI Media is a uh, an access services and localization business, and we provide live and pre-recorded um, subtitles. And uh, certainly, uh, this goes back to um, probably um, last year, I think, middle of last year, where we started to get more and more requests from organizations in the corporate space, uh, predominantly for um, live translated um, subtitles, so taking, um, in the most part, the English spoken presentation into um, a, a number of requested languages um, from kind of uh, the, the more common European languages um, uh, in, in French and Spanish, uh, but also uh, a fairly consistent uh, request for for uh, languages such as Japanese and and uh, and, and Chinese um, Mandarin. So um, from our side, that that really has accelerated since then, and 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 most of all in the last three months. Um, during the the COVID nineteen pandemic, uh, we've seen a, a significant increase in in online requests for subtitling and in general um, intralingual. Um, in in the most part, is what we deliver, uh, but interlingual um, certainly has uh, has increased, and we're seeing uh, a lot of demand uh, from. Uh, large corporate organizations who have um, employees based all over the world. So where English is maybe the business language, um, but it's not necessarily the um, uh, the, the uh, first language for most of the employees that are joining town halls or, or um, AGMs or just um, intercompany meetings where 
access uh, to to the uh, translation is um, is required, but um, they are opting for um, having subtitles because then they can be retained um, and used uh, for other benefits as well, such as search and and time coded uh, timestamps on the video. Um, so yeah, I think um, this is this is certainly something that we're um, starting to to do more work in, and, and starting to, as Pablo mentioned, reach out to more more freelancers who are um, skilled in this profession of um, interlingual respeaking. Um, and I certainly see uh, some opportunities and some challenges. I think um, one thing certainly that we we found is that. Um, in certain languages that have been requested, Arabic is is one of the main ones that we get asked about um, for intra and interlingual. Um, having the capability to deliver certain languages um, via re-speaking is 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 somewhat limited in that um, at the moment. Um, uh, you know, Dragon is a, a kind of main provider of the speech to text. Um, piece of re-speaking is, is is limited to a certain number of languages that you can you can work with in this, to a level that that um, gives you the accuracy so that's interesting and then the other part really is uh, is the price um, and trying to just um, understand where the market uh, is at in terms of of what um, what price point is is kind of uh, going to enable us to uh, to roll this out to more organisations and create more more access for for languages and and that's where the machine translation um, conversation comes in because uh, that can provide a level of access that is not as high quality as um, as a, a human interlingual re-speaker but at least provides a level of um, of of access. Um, that we can maybe talk a bit more about, but certainly from my view, this is a, a space that that I'm interested in in understanding and learning myself um, a bit more about, um, you know, what's what's possible um, as we kind of um, yeah dive further into it. That's brilliant, James. Thank you. It's very very useful to hear about the demand. Um, Carlo, I wonder if you're there. Can you hear me? Yes, Carlo. Carlo uh, has Do been provided. You've been re-speaking today, Carlo. I am re-speaking today, yes. Uh, not now, I suppose, but yes. No, but, but monitoring my uh, my people here. Wonderful. I don't know Intra if you can lingual, Carlo? No, no, this is intralingual from Italian into Italian, but it's uh, um, animated Italian into plain Italian. So uh, <laughs> it's a sort of interlingual. Uh, re-speaking because some speakers here speak with um, a very strong accent or with um, a syntactical, um, uh, I mean they don't plan the, uh, what they say so you have to guess what they mean and then only after that you can start uh, doing re-speaking. So with these kind of speakers it's as if you were doing interlingual. Mm -hmm. There are many. Um, there are many. Um, Carlo, can you tell us a bit yes. more about um, the different options that are out there for, in order to provide interlingual uh, life tackling? So yes, we've spoken about interlingual respeaking, but what's what is interlingual re or what are interlingual re speakers up against? If you know what I mean, what are the other options with uh, fully or semi-automatic um, alternatives? Uh, well, yes, um, with uh, Intersteno, which is the uh, international federation of, of people doing this kind of job, we have tested several uh, techniques to produce uh, live subtitles um, because uh, it is an international federation and delegates there, they don't speak English, but uh, they don't all speak English very well. So in order to, 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 have, uh, to, to facilitate communication among them, uh, we have basically studied several uh, ways of doing subtitles um, and we have used different techniques. You say that uh, Global Alliance is technique uh, agnostic and that's what in the sum is also. Uh, um, uh, so we have tested um, uh, re speaking plus uh, um, interlingual re speaking plus a live editor or uh, intralingual uh, velotype into, uh, from English into English and then 
automatic translation. Um, we have tested uh, several, uh, we have tested a simultaneous interpreter plus uh, stenotypist into the same language. Um, yeah, we have tested basically all techniques and um, uh, all methods. And we have also tested something interesting, which is the use of plain language uh, to produce intralingual subtitles into the same language, but simple enough that the automatic translation tool is able to translate this text in um, quality, which is probably not the same as the interlingual uh, the speaker or subtitler, but uh, which is higher than 90%. And this is something that some interlingual speaking methods weren't able to guarantee. So uh, in this case, uh, we have used something which is a sort of a taboo, uh, automatic translation, to produce uh, subtitles which are okay for a given kind of audience. Uh, of course, TV audience cannot be, can, can access these subtitles. But for example, if you think of a context where people all know each other and uh, they need a lot of interlingual subtitles, uh, if you have uh, a tool which automatically translates a text into 10 languages, this facilitates communication a lot. Uh, so there are cons, of course, but this has been uh, something that is, um, well, we are particularly happy with that because it guarantees 92%, uh, I think, uh, accuracy, which is good for us. So you're thinking one of the options there involves um, intralingually subtitling the original in a way that you kind of simplify it so as to help the machine translation software to get it uh, right, yeah? Correct. Correct. Mm -hmm. Basically, uh, when I say um, simplified language, it's all about syntax, huh? yeah. because the software is capable of uh, um, translating difficult words. Uh, of course, um, acronyms is something that can be a challenge, uh, but figures, for example, the machine is <laughs> better than us in recognizing, uh, in translating uh, numbers and figures. Uh, so, for example, if you think of German, which is a very complex language, when uh, talking of uh, numbers, or also French, it's uh, much easier to have a machine translating them than a, than a, than a person. Um, and the same is for very technical terms, such as name of, names of birds, this is something we were translating uh, last week, names of birds and fish. Uh, I didn't even know those names in Italian, so it was <laughs> difficult for me to, to think of a translation into another language. Um, uh, so, um, yes, yeah, basically syntax and uh, trying to make uh, a sent a sh short sentences and a sentence in a concept. And Carlo, um, we've got a question in the chat, which is probably a question that um, more than one of the participants may have now, which is of the attendees, which is, have you got any oh, okay. results that you can quickly tell us about in terms of how, in this case, for example, interlingual speaking compares in efficiency and accuracy with the Look, other methods? Yeah, I, I think I have, well, no, I think I, I have prepared <laughs> some, uh, some slides. If uh, I'm allowed to, to share them, they are not particularly nice, uh, but they uh, do the job. Um, can I share them? Yes, you can. You're welcome to. Uh, if I'm able to do so, let me. Uh, Antwerpen, 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 no, Dutka, Next no. Next in, in on your screen, in the yes. left, uh, on the right, sorry, corner, yeah, you I have, have chat box share. and attendees and then share content. And I think the easiest way is to share a screen for you. Share file, condividi lavagna vuota. The problem is that the translation is very bad. Uh, application schema, probably. Yes, I think it's. it's yes, application one. screen. Yes. Il tuo intero schermo. Yes. 
No, but now I'm not able to, to manage it. <laughs> no, sorry for that. And you should try to share not the entire screen, but the application window. And then you can choose which application you can you want to share. Finestra dell'applicazione. Yes. It's finestra dell'applicazione. Uh, so if you can you see it now? Yes. We okay. can. Uh, we have uh, uh, we have uh, analyzed these five forms of uh, um, of interlingual live subtitling uh, forms, um, and we have compared them in terms of words per minute, in terms of notions being rendered, and in terms of delay. And um, we have seen that the most efficient one is uh, number one, meaning a simultaneous interpreter uh, plus uh, a stenotypist transcribing what is said. This is the most accurate uh, form of translate of interlingual live subtitling. Uh, but it, as you can see, the delay is uh, 7.3, which is one of the highest. Uh, the quickest is uh, number two, is an interlingual velotypist producing subtitling, subtitling subtitles from German into English. Um, good results uh, have been provided, as I was saying before, by um, number four, uh, meaning a risk speaker transcribing the source text, the speech, into plain English, and then automatic translation translated it. And with a 92% uh, notions, uh, with um, uh, with a reduction of the uh, of the source text of 14%, which is quite a lot, but it's uh, um, I mean the, the number of notions rendered was 92%, and as you can see, is uh, much higher than people doing the job in this case. If you consider number three, um, uh, and number three, yeah, you have uh, an intralingual velotypist doing verbatim. I, I'm not sure I'm you're understanding what I'm saying because I haven't planned this uh, speech today. But uh, the, no, the question the, the question is that when you translate, uh, you, if you use automatic translation with a verbatim text, meaning a text that has been respoken word for word, uh, well, this, this text um, is only good. Uh, quality is 71%. While if you translate into plain language, uh, the quality after automatic translation is 92%, which is a huge increase. And this data you can find in uh, an article that Pablo and I have published, and which was in the reference list. Um, we have compared other uh, tools. We have compared tools to do live subtitles. And what is interesting is that um, though in the past, there were a lot of differences between uh, uh, QWERTY, stenotyping, velotyping, and respeaking. Today, at the World Championship of Fast Writing, um, people with all these uh, techniques, so uh, respeakers, velotypists, stenotypists, and QWERTY keyboard typists, were able to produce uh, 352 syllables per minute for 10 minutes. Uh, so basically, we can say that uh, you can use today whatever technique to produce live subtitles. Uh, and the quality is, as you can see, more or less the same. Apart from the stenotypists, the number of penalties was very similar. Carlo, this is very useful. Um, and when you were talking about the different uh, options, I mean, we'll move on now to Daniela, but when you're talking about the different options, um, if I'm not mistaken, uh, you didn't test interlingual re-speaking, right there? Yes, we tested interlingual velotyping. Yeah, exactly. So, Which so is there, more or less the same, but yeah. velotype instead of uh, re-speaking. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it would be interesting um, in general, I would imagine, to test uh, interlingual re-speaking there, and also another option that I believe is being used at the moment, which is conference interpreter plus, for example, automatic speech recognition. That, that's quite an interesting um, option as well. And, and see exactly, as you say, how that reflects in not only accuracy, but also 
uh, delay. So maybe yeah, I can talk about to... Just a last, yeah. uh, last piece of data. Uh, yes, if you see this, uh, this slide, this is intralingual, it's not interlingual, uh, but uh, as you can see here, uh, the quality uh, is, uh, uh, of QWERTY keyboard typists is higher when doing verbatim uh, than uh, uh, stenotypists with speakers and automatic translation. And, sorry, automatic transcription. Um, and when and then talking of uh, uh, so if you do verbatim, uh, the, the ones who performed uh, the best were uh, people with a QWERTY keyboard, uh, which was quite bizarre as a piece of data. Uh, and when talking of uh, um, and when compare these people with a uh, wrist speaker doing sensatim, do, meaning doing uh, notion for notion, idea unit for idea unit instead of doing word for word, uh, the quality was higher compared to uh, the QWERTY keyboard typist. Thank you. There, there's a question by Wukas saying, how do they manage to achieve a speed with such a speed with QWERTY, Carlo? Uh, Daniela was wondering if that is with shortcuts, for example, auto hotkey, for example? No, no, no. no. Well, yes, there are. Um, uh, was I able to uh, stop sharing? Yes. Yes. You, yes. You were. Okay. Um, well, uh, there are people who are able to type up to uh, the world champion is typing 969 characters per minute. Uh, so it's almost 1,000 uh, with no mistakes for 10 minutes. So um, I'm I'm talking of uh, of course not of a mass of people, I'm talking of uh, single people who are doing this for job and uh, they excelled. No, 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 I, uh, some people do use shortcuts in uh, with uh, QWERTY keyboards, but other people, they, uh, they, 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 they don't have them in uh, their keyboard. For example, the guy doing 969 is not using uh, shortcuts. We have um, uh, video recorded him and slowed the uh, the video to see how many uh, characters he was able to type a second, and it is 17 characters a second. Okay, thank you, Carlo. This is very interesting, very impressive too. Um, I guess yeah. now the question now turns into uh, all about interlingual, which concerned with now. Um, Daniela, maybe you can tell us a little bit about um, your experience with interlingual reading and, and how do you think it compares to other methods and perhaps even you can touch upon some of the challenges that you're finding as well. So you uh, you uh, mean inter or intra? I didn't uh, in get inter. that. Inter, inter, okay. Yeah. Um, well, the challenge of interlingual is obviously a lot higher. Also, as Haley brought up, that the cognitive load is practically double. Um, some interesting thing I found out is that when interpreting into English, which for me is a C language, so not really good language to interpret, it works, it kind of works, because you have to express yourself in a more condensed form, as also Carlo said already, to make a target text readable and cons comprehensible. You have to use a different kind of wording, but mainly a different kind of syntax. And you have to do short sentences. So this was a very um, interesting experience because I would never do a conference interpreting assignment from German into English, for example. And Daniela, Daniela, the settings in which you normally provide this kind of service or uh, interlingual re-speaking? These, uh, these have been some uh, weird conferences, uh, such as the Walker Stalker Con, for example. Do you know uh, The Walking Dead? Yep. They do these big, huge um, conferences. And uh, I did that in, in Berlin and in Mannheim. 
this for the conference settings. Then we had a very interesting uh, venue at in Munich for uh, constructing Euro constructing Europe. I think uh, it was called. And this was mainly um, poets, lyrics, um, what else? Um, artists, main, mainly artists. Um, we did that also um, interlingually. And what I do most in this moment is um, interpreting simultaneously into English uh, doctor's appointments for refugees with hearing loss. So, But this is speech to text, Daniela, yeah? So we will be speaking there for that. This is interlingual, yes. The doctors speak German and I write for the deaf or uh, hard of hearing refugees in English. Mm -hmm. And how do they access your respoken titles? Uh, I uh, the first assignments I did on site, so I was there. But now uh, I got them uh, quite good uh, technical equipment and a uh, independent internet uh, hotspot, so that they got really a very good um, internet connection, and they get my I am wherever I am, and they get my uh, live text on their laptop or tablet or even a smartphone. And I use a platform for it. Wonderful. The The platform is an issue that um, we definitely need to touch upon because um, mm -hmm. Nancy and Jacob, yeah. who are part of the, uh, well, who've been active in the chat today, um, they've been trained, as I said before, I think I said earlier, with trade with ILSA materials, and they are now currently providing intra and interlingual respeaking, and they've been telling us about the issues that they have for remote captioning. Some platforms do allow you to display subtitles in Zoom or uh, text on tap, for example, here, but often they don't make it so easy for to work with a co-editor. Um, what do you think about this? What are the main challenges there? Do you use Daniela? Well, uh, the problem is I do uh, use uh, a platform which is owned by a private company that provides speech-to-text interpreting, and the, they don't don't uh, provide it to third parties normally. So um, there are some uh, companies at this very moment um, developing platforms. Uh, one of those. Uh, is placed in uh, in Austria, in Vienna, and we are really hoping to get some first results by the end of July. And these are platforms that allow, for example, co-editing, which for me is the most important thing to provide a very high quality target text. Because even in intralingual life subtitling or intralingual speech or text interpreting, as I prefer to say, uh, you have got a very high um, cognitive load, especially when the content is very dense. If the speakers are talking very, uh, talking around, like Carlo explained just now, and uh, you have to hear, to understand, to process to produce, then to monitor what you have produced, then to correct what you produced if you had some mistake. And in the meantime, you have to keep on listening and keep on working. So this is uh, sometimes quite a lot. So if you have got a second person working with you on the same platform that can do corrections or um, complement something that you left out, for example, then the end, the, the quality you end up with is a lot higher. So we, for example, we have a rule, the active sentence belongs to the interpreting person and the sentences uh, before belongs to the co-editor. So we don't get crossed, so we don't uh, correct twice the same. But for example, in interlingual like, um, speech or text interpreting, we don't correct unless I'm very sure that I said something wrong, then I correct. 
but normally the co-editor does the 100% of the correcting work. And we're talking about um, working conditions in terms of time as well. Um, could you remind us, what do you think it's um, a good uh, and reasonable duration for, a re for an interlingual re-speaker shift? Okay, uh, you know maybe uh, there are quite a lot of investigations of the duration of a normal conference interpreter uh, being able to deliver um, the same quality. And this is always between 40 and 45 minutes. And why conference interpreters only do up to a maximum of one hour alone and if it's more so if you um, break this down on interlingual speech text interpreting, the time must even be shorter because we are doing practically the double of what a normal, excuse me, my telephone rings, because what a normal uh, conference interpreter does, he only speaks. The interlingual speech text interpreter has to dictate in a machine appropriate way, has to monitor, has to correct. So this is a lot more. And so we, well, normally we do 10 minutes shift in an interlingual live subtitling. Sometimes if it's not too dense and if the people are not talking too uh, quickly, we do the 15 minutes. But we normally do not do single assignments when interlingually live subtitling, exactly because you are not so able to correct by yourself. If you have to listen and to translate and to produce and to monitor and to correct. Mm -hmm. Does this answer your question? Yes, it does, Daniela. Thank you. Um, I don't know if Elena David is still there. Um, maybe not, because I saw that she was um, kind of disconnected, maybe. Okay, um, when when she's back, we'll be able to resume. Um, I wanted to ask a question to, to James now, James. Um, have you tested James? Uh, yeah, I've just got a, a private message from Elena saying connectivity issues, so as soon as she's back, I'll be able to ask her. But James, have you tested, um, you know, when you have those kind of uh, demands, what else, apart from interlingual re-speaking, have you tested Interpreting plus maybe, I don't know, automatic speech recognition or how, how have you gone about it? Um, <clears throat> yes, so it's been interesting actually listening to, to those comments because I think uh, we're all arriving at the same um, um, ideas and, and, uh, and ways of, of, um, of, of getting to, to the translation. So we, we have used other scenarios. Um, the, the most common that we've used for human delivered um uh high quality um interlingual uh captioning um is with a, a simultaneous interpreter and then an intralingual uh re speaker uh, working alongside them so um what that does provide and i think to um to to daniela's point is that uh the the um the re speaker can focus on on the same language without the interpretation um, piece going on at the same time. Can re speak for a little bit longer. Um, can can maybe edit themselves um, uh, on the fly. Um, so that that is a common use that we have for um, one of our um, clients in particular who um, who we're working with um, that is is taking French into English. Um, we we use the simultaneous interpreter um, that is is um, a professional in that area of business, which is sport in this in this scenario, um, football, um, and then a, an intralingual English uh, re-speaker to to deliver the output, um, and that works that works as a you know a, a very good method for for us and for the customer. Um, and James, sorry to interrupt you, but that when you use the conference interpreter and intralingual re-speaker, um, I would imagine quality was good. What about delay? Did it involve a lot of delay? Or? Yeah, so the reason why this works well in, in this scenario is that the, the output is a, is a live stream. Uh, so it's going to YouTube um, with the, the, the live uh, subtitles um, uh, on top of the, the video. And what that enables us to do um, 
from AI Media's perspective is delay the feed so we actually can time the subtitles to the output so they're perfectly in sync with the French speaker with English live subtitles on uh, on top so um, we can overcome that because of the, the the nature of the the live broadcast obviously for other scenarios that's that's not possible and you get the added delay um, that comes with that so that's why in this case it it, it it's uh, the delay is, is removed by us delaying the, the live feed and timing that with the, the subtitles Brilliant. Um, yeah so that that is a way around it that that, that um you know but we do that for um intralingual live caption on on live streaming as well remove that that delay that the inherent delay with the intralingual respeaker so that we can time um the the subtitles perfectly um which okay. you know the benefit of technology enables us to do that and and similarly with um machine translation um which was was interesting carlo to to hear you talk about the, the simple text format um is also something that that we have trained our our english uh, intralingual respeakers to to uh, to do to to caption in short sharper sentences um to create a, a higher quality translation via machine um which you know enables us to scale the number of lang or enables customers to scale the number of languages uh, that they'd like to translate into um even those that aren't necessarily available um with um whether it's typist velo typist respeaker stenographer etc um so yeah so we we're using some of these methods as well um and uh what i've been really interested in and interested in, in further is is the data around the accuracy which i think carly you've done some great work on so yeah a bit more information on that is is something that's asked often what is the accuracy of you know, if I have an English meeting and, and I want it in French via machine translation to, to reduce cost or whatever the reason is, what's the accuracy going to be? Um, is the common question that that um, that customers are asking. Um, which is sometimes where we then bring in the, the conversation around a human solution, which um, you know can uh, in in certainly in a in the corporate space we've found. Um, rightly or, or wrongly gives more comfort in in the accuracy um, and in most cases rightly for us as, as to our experience thank you for that james um and with eleanor's work because um it becomes quite um evident that some of the work that needs to be done in terms of research is to look into all these issues and methods and uh, eleanor what are you uh, going to be working on and how do you see that from your standpoint of i don't know coming from an interpretive background as well both as a trainer and as a researcher thank you very much can you hear me okay i'm sorry i'm having huge connectivity issues yeah, today. No problem. No problem. Okay, all right. Thank you very much. Uh, first of all, for the opportunity to be here and to listen to all the progress you've done in ILSA and uh, and participate in this discussion. Well, what we uh, what we would like to do in the Project SMART that you are also part of is basically to, to sort of build on what ILSA has done and continue to research uh, this, uh, what I call the human-centered uh, dimension or human-centered uh, workflow, if you want, of, uh, of interlingual speaking, because I believe that there is still a, like a lot to gain in terms of research, of understanding of what are the actual underlying mechanisms of this such a complex practice. I mean, you mentioned that I come from the field of interpreting. I am a conference interpreter myself by training and uh, I can see interlingual speaking as this kind of enhanced interpreting 2.0, if you want, and, and so complex that deserves further attention, while we also look at what other workflows are sort of um, experimented in reality. So just to say um, perhaps a little bit about, about SMART, well, first of all, I want to say that it's, um, it's a project that is, is starting now. So somehow what we aim to do is actually kicking off today. Today is the official starting date. And it's to, um, to look at um, human-centered workflow and to sort of capitalize on what Ilsa has done in terms of work on the competencies and uh, skills that are necessary to so look more in depth into the cognitive skills, cognitive abilities and interpersonal traits that are also required uh, by this complex task. And uh, quite a lot of empirical research has been done. We know that it has mostly been done with students 
and um, one way in which SMART aims to differentiate from, uh, from uh, previous projects is to look at professionals. So actually targeting a population of language professionals, and we are in the process of defining what we mean by language professionals, but people from interpreting, from relevant backgrounds, subtitling and interlingually speaking, they have these solid skills in place, mostly the life translation skills, and therefore to see uh, not only what they need to learn in order to be able to, um, to perform interlingually speaking, but also what they need to unlearn and how skills acquisition can actually happen and how we can optimize this process. So somehow what we are aiming to do is target this population, carry out experiments with them uh, to, as I said, capture variables that not only belong to procedural skills, so task-based skills, but also cognitive abilities like um, lateral thinking, cognitive flexibility, working memory, uh, ex and different types of executive functions. And this is why in the consortium we have experts in cognitive psychology and neuroscience, for instance, and interpersonal traits like self-efficacy and, uh, I don't know, goal orientation, to see what also can, what variables can moderate performance and also what could be good prerequisites for interlingually speaking. And I feel that this could feed into practice in different ways. Uh, one way could be to help recruitment, for instance. We've heard James, uh, James um, also talk about, you know, scaling up recruitment, who are the people that, that we need to, that could perform this job. So understanding prerequisites by looking, you know, also at cognitive abilities that we know from interpreting research underpin this performance, this, this, this task, that could be very helpful and also people that can have the motivation to take up such a complex task and to continue to challenge themselves to do something so complex. And also I feel that studying, so kind of this research look at this practice, really understanding the, the, the complexities of it and trying to build on what we know from cognitive studies in interpreting, for instance, and cognitive psychology, as well as other strands of research, really can help in the long term to to feed into working conditions. I think that's one big, uh, so fatigue, stress, we've heard today, it's like the same similar debates as we have in interpreting, how long should a shift be, uh, when does fatigue kicks in, and there are different variables that can moderate that. So the idea is to create an evidence base that can actually inform then working practices. And ultimately, I think this kind of research can also help um, create a status for interlingual speakers, that recognizing the complexity of this task can actually inform the, and, you know, the profession and make it recognizable, make it have a status, inform fees and everything that I see the parallels with, for instance, conference interpreting when it started and, um, and how research has informed this, um, the status that it has acquired over time. So, yeah. No, thank you, Elena. This is really interesting because I was uh, your your last comment reminded me of some of the discussions that we've had within the consortium about the terminology and how, by calling it re-speaking, in a way we were uh, not recognizing much of the interpreting side of things. Um, and because interlingual re-speaking was taken up mostly by audiovisual translation and not by the interpreting community, then um, we may actually have to find a bit of a battle. To, to ensure that we, we treat these professionals now as interpreters, which is what they are, mm -hmm. as Fran said, um, and, and for this to be recognized as such because of the difficulty. I mean, we're talking about people who are doing the job that James was referring to being done by two people or by one, one person plus machine. So, um, and with that, I'd like to turn this, maybe open it a little bit to the and, and perhaps to as I said before, Nancy and, and Jacobo, who have been now trained as interlingual speakers and are beginning to do the job. Uh, I don't know whether, Nancy, Jacobo, you have any comments on uh, the complexity, on how you saw the uh, this technique when, as you were being trained, and how you see it now that are on the other side of it, when beginning to to kind of uh, spearhead the, the, the profession and, and being part of the pioneers in terms of professional practice of it. I don't know that Nancy and Jacobo, whether you're there and can make any comment. Let's see. 
while while that while that is happening, Elena, um, and oh yeah, Hakob is there. Brilliant. Yeah, I don't know if Nancy's there. I think she's not there anymore because she's based in Australia. She might be gone by now, just like sure. there. But um, yeah, well, I'd say that basically, um, actually, it was uh, depending on the depending on the specific uh, event, uh, you might have different degrees of difficulty. I'd say. Um, the course we took last year, the, the re-speaking course, it was based on a lot of materials were taken from television. I do think interlingual speaking uh, for television is uh, much more complex due to the nature of the problem, due to the um, continuous change of topics, for example, or and also due to the speed rate of the uh, production of the of the. Um, if you have light events, like the kind of events that you work with when you're a conference interpreter, which is the experience that I have so far uh, as an interlingual speaker in that kind of event, that makes it easier for, for me. But of course, coming from the, the realm of um, conference interpreting, voice-to-voice -voice interpreting, I'd say, that as you have been saying already today, there are, uh, I mean, it's, it's a more complex activity because you need to uh, the things that you do as an interpreter, you need to add, uh, of course, a number of efforts, as specific uh, efforts, such, such as the suspension marks, and um, sometimes when they are turn, when there is a turn, where different different speakers taking turns, or you need to also introduce some sort of uh, uh, written signal or the name of the person who's taking the, the the floor at that specific moment. So and then of course the co-editing thing. I agree, as Daniela said and Tim said already, that co-editing is very important uh, in terms of. Uh, um, I hear me properly. Can you hear me properly now? Can you hear me properly? Oh, yeah, mostly okay. Go. Uh, cool. uh, so um, co-editing is very important. I think also in terms of uh, freeing you uh, of the present speaking at that moment since we work in that I think would be the ideal way to work because that enhances the quality of the work of the product and uh, you don't need to be um, paying attention to that if you can focus on interpreting uh, which is the same thing that you do when you're a conference interpreter plus the punctuation marks um, and if you can uh, uh, be able to not have to worry about uh, correcting uh, I think that the uh, the ideal way to work and of course um, uh, working remotely sound quality is a challenge also or it's a problem I'd say but I think this is sometimes uh, something that does not really depend on anybody who is uh, organizing the, the, the meeting that depends on uh, the uh, internet connection that the different speakers might have in their uh, original in the, in the places where, where they're based uh, Nancy and I have worked in some uh, meeting in taking place in different parts of Latin America. The, the speakers were from different parts of Latin America. And in, in some cases there were connectivity problems. So, uh, of course, that has an impact on the subtitles. But, uh, of course, that the sound quality is uh, very important because uh, in some of the, depending on the software that you use, um, the, the quality of the sound can be worse and, and sometimes I mean, I mean, that makes it almost impossible. And also to be able to see what is taking place in, during the meeting uh, when they are using, for example, PowerPoint presentations uh, because sometimes you can refer to the PowerPoint presentation in the subtitle. You can uh, uh, encourage people to read what's in the subtitle instead of um, dictating it into the subtitle. So, um, yeah, I'd, I'd say um, it, there's still like uh, um, a lot of well things to improve uh, in terms of conditions uh, to be able to, I mean, uh, the, the best the conditions are, I mean, you have uh, the ideal conditions, if you want to get the ideal uh, product of your work, um, definitely the conditions have to be ideal of, uh, also. Mm -hmm. So that's what I would uh, say for now. Thank you very much, Jacobo. This is very useful. Um, I see that Nancy is there as well, probably agreeing with you. Then we have a few questions. Uh, I think Elena, uh, no, um, Daniela raised her hand. And we have a question from Lola uh, saying, how do two people share subtitles in order to co-edit um, this? 
Uh, Nancy, would you like to answer this? Uh, I don't think we can hear you, Nancy. Perhaps um, either your microphone is muted or you need to be made into a presenter, which I don't think you have been made into. Maybe, Isabel, you can try that. I think that's an issue that we had before. Yes, I, I, I think it should work now. Okay, can you try now, Nancy? Um, it's still still not working. Um, While we get that... Um, I'm, I'm going to, to make her a presenter and maybe it yeah, will work. Okay? That's right. I think. Okay. Nancy, could you try now? Mm, no, I don't think it's working, at least not on my end. Um, Daniela, you had a you had raised your hand, and I will try to get it sorted with with Nancy, if that's okay. Yeah, um, it, it, it was exactly um, referring to what uh, Jacobo said. Uh, it's exactly the reason why I prefer to do a semi-presential version. So I have got one speech to text interpreter on site and another one remote. So the on site. Uh, interpreter can uh, get all the information that you can have on site and he can do the uh, troubleshooting for uh, um, transfer of of, um, of audio and he can take over if the internet collapses Um, is it, Isabel, is it just me or I mean, I think I think that's uh, an example of remote issues, Pablo. Uh, no, with, no, with audio, no we've, <clears throat> we've had a couple of real life ones. Absolutely. Oh, no. of combining. I, Daniela, I, I, think, I, I think I think you lost me for a second. Yes. yes. Yeah, as you were explaining how important it was to <laughs> have all right and I, I don't know. A good point. Up to where did you hear me? Uh, we heard you about the importance of having an on-site and then you demonstrated it with a practical example. Yeah, exactly. So uh, if one is uh, troubleshooting on-site and is getting on, all the information on-site and can uh, intervene if necessary, and the other one is working and covering up uh, uh, remotely. And this has been the best way for us to do complex settings. Yeah, that, that's that's a very interesting point. Um, because then, yeah. you know, one of the issues is availability of good speech to text interpreters. So having at least one on site and the other one remote, so you get this problem down a little bit. Absolutely, Nancy. I don't know whether you're. I mean, you are still there. I don't know whether you can hear you now. No, I'm afraid not. Sorry about that, Nancy. Uh, but um, if there's anything that you can uh, contribute to via the chat, we'll we'll have a look. Yeah, uh, I'm conscious that we're um, running over time, um, a little bit over the agreed time, scheduled time. Let's just have a look and see if there's any other questions coming up. I think Pablo, there's one there from Charlotte, which I can take, uh, which is uh, what seems to be the most important factor for clients: accuracy, price, speci specialist subject knowledge, etc. Um, and I, I was just thinking about this point um, as we were, were talking. Now, I think there are there are different scenarios where um, we will start to recommend uh, the type of delivery um, and factor in all of those those points there. Um, because just to give a quick example of where we we must use a um, human only workflow, whether that's a interlingual respeaker or um, or simultaneous interpreter plus intralingual, is one of our customers has very specific terms that they would like uh, to be to be captioned, um, but how they say them. Um, so to to give a clear example, they use nicknames for certain people's names but they would like the actual name to be captioned so um, uh, an example is um, is say um, Pablo your name Pablo Romero Fesco we might call you Pab or Pabs 
um, but they would like the uh, the name to come out accurately as uh, your full name. So if you're in a machine, my point being, if you're using machine translation or machine uh, speech to text in any part of that workflow, it would actually take the the term or the name um, that is spoken. So it won't be able to do that that kind of mental um, uh, move to to catch capture the actual name. So I think what we'll where we'll we'll arrive as a as a business is that we will have to assess the scenario of what the customer is asking for um, and then recommend the solution um, and that will come down to things like accuracy, things like terminology that needs to be used um, and also price. Um, say the most important factor at the moment when we're discussing this with, um, uh, with customers is accuracy. Um, uh, they are looking, the, the majority of our um, inquiries are for high quality accuracy. Um, and uh, and that is why the question of machine translation, whenever it's offered as a solution, um, the question is always accuracy. Um, undoubtedly, it's it's cheaper um, with machine, but uh, but when we're discussing potentially um, high-profile financial records or um, you know detailed accounts um, for um, AGMs or, or business meetings, it, it needs to be accurate. Um, and that's that's the biggest concern for for customers. They uh, they don't want their messaging. Um, we do a lot of of, of captioning for um, um, business leaders, and they want their message to be delivered in the same way that it's spoken in their own language in the translated language. So that's a big a big part of the uh, conversation. Thank you very much, James. Um, we're approaching the end now. I was just looking for um, some of the questions that were missed there. Aline has left, um, but she was reminding me that there was a question there that she asked um, Ellen, actually. How do you factor in the impact of new contexts on the skills required on the possibilities of automation? For example, streaming. Ellen, I don't know if you can take that question. It's a little yes. bit higher up. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, uh, yeah, absolutely. OK. so. Well, in the actual experiment that we are uh, conducting, and by the way, I, because of all the connectivity issue, I haven't really mentioned who the partners are, but I'm happy to say it's the University of Vigo, University of International Studies in Rome, uh, University of Roehampton, and then we have uh, Vienna and Antwerp in France, for Schacher and in the Mile, as well as Macquarie University, um, Jan Louis Kruger, and a number of industry stakeholders, so Jamie representing uh, James representing AI Media, the Lux, uh, Fred, and uh, Sky, the broadcaster. So it's 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 a large consortium. Um, I think the the focus is on um, on this human centered perspective, right? And understanding what the uh, kind of so we we know from have, you know having talked and and one of the key questions is what is the profile? What are the skills? What is the profile that seems to to be the best suited for this task. And I would like in the project to sort of shy away from, is it the speaker, is it interpreter, is it subtitles from these labels, and sort of focus more on the actual underlying skills, some of which are procedural, some of which are cognitive, and they are part of the profile of the person. So we are trying to capture, say, a snapshot of different profiles of the people that come in that have strong skills in place, but as I said, they're professionals, but they want to upskill. And by doing so, basically one of the uh, of the things is to to shy away from this distinction between uh, traditional professions and perhaps create or come up with new prerequisites that that cross uh, across the board that they do not belong to one profile or the other, but kind of overlap across different profiles. So that being the the key the key sort of uh, focus, we want them to test. Uh, performance against different task character characteristics, so against different types of genre, if you want, and uh, that will be the main focus of the actual experiment, to see not only, I mean, can an interpreter do this, but in what condition, under what circumstances, under what task characteristics, what are the variables that can influence performance. So this will be the sort of starting point of the experiments, and the data will help us inform this specific workflow. Now, when it comes to automation and uh, other conditions, I think they belong to the next step. 
they will be part of also adaptive expertise that we want to see uh, how it operates with professionals. So we are not aiming to test any automated or semi-automated workflow within the, the, the kind of process itself, if that's the question that was asked. But we would like to map yes. it out. So one of the things is to map out different workflows and systematize what has been discussed today, what has started to be discussed with ISA. We are running parallel projects that test other workflows. One of those, I don't know if it's been mentioned, maybe when I, when I dropped out, but it's uh, intralingua speaking and machine translation yeah. uh, for the purpose of, uh, for instance, providing um, the service in multiple languages. We have a, a pilot project that is actually testing this workflow. And just to link up to what Carlo was saying, we believe there is a case for, for doing this in a context where speeches are pre-prepared, pre-written, sort of the syntax is good, the, they're sort of pre-packaged in a way that if they are respoken correctly intralingually, then could provide a good source text for machine translation. So again, many variables, and I think it's the role of research to sort of highlight all these variables, what can factor in to be able to inform what is the best sustainable workload in a specific situ in every specific situation that we may encounter. Thank you very much, Elena. Um, I think we need to um, start um, wrapping up, but I'd like to take some of the issues, maybe by way of summary, that were in the chat as well. After Ian's question, there was also Nancy's um, contributions, and she was talking about technology and how, at the moment, the platforms that are being used by interlingual speakers, for example, do not cater for all the needs in terms of fixing errors, um, working more efficiently in pairs, etc. Um, and uh, Evan was reminded her of, of text on top or text on tap and the fact that with some of these applications you can actually talk to the developers and, and try to add um, the bits and bobs that are needed for interlingual speaking but Nancy was reminding us as well of the fact that sometimes it's the client who comes with their own choice of software um, be it stream text or anything else um, and that may make things a little bit difficult and that led uh, and you know that's one of the applications team viewer is another one for example um, and that led to Nancy and Carlo um, kind of pr prompted the discussion about client education. Uh, this is quite interesting because some of the companies that have contacted us from the US, for example, they did not know that there was such thing as interlingual speaker, that there was a possibility of one professional alongside a co-worker doing the whole job, for example, um, or they were talking about bilingual captioners as in well, as if you know the other language, then that's enough to be able to do interlingual speaking. So I think there is a great deal of clientation to be done. Carlo was saying that education is never going to be enough because in Italian, uh, in people still call interpreters translators. Um, and I'm sure that's the case, as, as Heiko was saying, also in other countries like Spain. But one cannot help but think that we are in a similar position as we were uh, in, say, 2010 when intralingual re-speaking was kind of mainstreamed. Um, and and there were different ways to go about the same thing. All Everyone looking for the same product. Now we have any more options. So maybe it's an issue of, as you all have said, um, what is needed with what quality for what kind of purpose, setting, context, etc. So for interlingual re-speaking, for interlingual re-speakers, maybe it's an issue of making sure that their work is valued, the rates are fair, and that maybe the, the battle is not to lower the rates, but perhaps, as Daniela was implying, to provide good quality that can compete um, with with the other methods that are available. Um, I don't know if there's any other question. Is that because all the editing is visible for a different reason? Uh, that's a question from Zoe to Daniela. Um, but I don't know exactly what was going to. Uh, Carlo, you wanted to say something, uh, and then we'll probably wrap up. Yeah, so uh, the um, the question of education is very important, um, as well as uh, because uh, clients, uh, for example, sometimes say, "Why do subtitles are late?" So uh, we are talking of very basic concepts such as delay, which is inevitable in live subtitling. And uh, people consider it as a uh, as bad quality subtitles. So uh, <laughs> there is the need for education to educate clients a lot. Uh, 
because it's not simply a question of spelling or of accuracy, it's also a question of uh, explaining them what um, what you do, why you decide to uh, compress a sentence, why you leave something out, why uh, you are uh, late with the subtitles. Yeah, that's a good point, Carlo, because actually when we talk about uh, quality, it's not just accuracy, is it? It's accuracy, it's delay. So having um, a, a quick way of showing the client, well, these are the methods and this is the kind of quality that you can expect with different types of method in terms of accuracy and quality. Uh, sorry, accuracy and delay, for example. That would be particularly useful. Um, it's gonna, I think we're going to go on <laughs> for longer. But uh, okay. Daniela, could you, would you like to say something else? Yes. Yeah. Uh, Daniela, is still there? This is interesting flashes for yes, do you hear me? Do you hear me? I, I can hear you now. Ah, okay, fine. So uh, it's uh, just underlining, uh, as supporting what uh, said Carlo. It's so important to have interpreting strategies. You have these uh, like anticipation. Uh, Daniela, I think it's cutting off. Um, Text interpreting. Okay. Yeah. I could only yep. get your the last so, word of what so you said. It, it all... I think maybe you should uh, yeah. switch, switch off your camera. Um, I think so, Daniela. Maybe if you could switch off your camera, yeah. Okay. Sorry. Maybe like that better? I think so. Okay. So it's the speech. It's interpreting strategies applied for speech to text interpreting. We uh, teach that in our. Uh, vocational courses because uh, it's it's especially important for people that have not been interpreters conference, conference interpreters before but even the conference interpreters uh, told me that it was a very good recall for them a very good repetition because they might have forgotten how important it is uh, for doing the interpretation because it has become automatic for them but when they start to do the uh, uh, speech to text interpreting, they forget that the same strategies have to be applied. Yeah, that is right, actually. Um, I think, uh, thank you, Daniela, for that. Um, I think we can wrap up now because most people are, are having to leave, and, and we did say that um, we would finish at six. Uh, so, uh, well, obviously, I just wanted to thank everyone for taking part, uh, the speakers in the panel. Um, I'm sorry we, we haven't had time for more, but I think we could have gone on for much longer. But since most of us have been here since uh, one o'clock, I think it's fair um, that we should wrap up now. Uh, thank you, Elena, for your contribution and good luck with the SMART project. Looking forward to hearing more about it in due course. Um, Carlo, Daniela, thank you very much as well for sharing your experiences and, and uh, James as well. Um, it's very good to have your, your view and I think it's actually very good to see how uh, it's all happening now with regard to this um, kind of provision of speech-to-text interpreting that we're talking about and actually uh, it's interesting to see that training, research and professional practice are so close together and you guys um, so close together despite the distance now uh, since we're doing this remotely. So um, very useful and thank you very much everyone. Um, Isabel, I'd like to then I think give you the floor so that you can give us the final details but before that since I won't have a chance to say anything after that. I'd like to thank you Is and everyone else in Antwerp because uh, this has been really interesting and uh, the way you've run it very smoothly as well. So thank you very much and public thanks to all the ILSA uh, team as well because it's been a joy to work with you over these three years um, and to see that this is actually happening and uh, finishing now. It's, I don't know, it makes one very uh, happy and very fortunate to have worked with you. So thank you very much and thank you for your effort today. Okay, thank you too. Uh, two small requests for the participants. So first, don't forget, if possible, to sign your declaration of attendance and to send it back to me. You know that it's the only way to get some funding from the EU for this event. And we also have a very, very short uh, survey for, for feedback that we need for our report as well. So here is the link again in the chat box. 
And finally, yes, I'd like to thank everybody for being here, for joining us on this platform. It's a bit of a different situation, but I think it worked well. Thank you for the uh, re-speaking, for the, the live subtitling. Um, thank you, everybody, all participants, my the, the partners, obviously, all partners in the in the project. And thank you uh, to the University of Antwerp for allowing us to use the platform for this event. So thank you.